Okay, so this is lecture 10 for the microbiology. This is going to be looking at antimicrobial drugs. So in the early 1900s, a third of children born died before age five from infectious diseases. So antibiotics have greatly improved our survival. Alexander Fleming was the one who discovered penicillin from mold. And Paul Ehrlich also played a role in the antibiotic age in discovering that arsenic could be used to kill syphilis. Chemotherapy is just the use of chemicals that are going to be selective to kill a pathogen with little or no effect on the patient. Or at least that's the desire is to have little or no effect on the patient. What we're looking for is selective toxicity. And this is possible because of the different structure of metabolism between the pathogen and the host. Ideally, you want to target something that the pathogen has and the host does not. So an antibiotic is an antimicrobial chemical that is naturally produced by microorganisms. One of the things we're seeing more and more today is antibiotic resistance. And this is where formerly effective medications now have less and less impact on bacteria. And this is for several reasons that we'll look at at the end. In 1932, sulfonylamide was the first practical antimicrobial that was put into widespread use in and used for a wide variety of infections. When we look at the semi-synthetics, these are going to be chemically modified antibiotics. And then synthetics are entirely synthetic antimicrobial agents. So our mechanisms of action of the antimicrobial drugs are going to be looking for the selective toxicity. So things they will target would be cell wall synthesis, protein synthesis, disrupting the cytoplasmic membrane, inhibiting non-human metabolic pathways, inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis, blocking recognition or attachment to the host. And this has worked pretty well. We do have a lot of limitations on antiviral drugs because they use host enzymes and ribosomes. So the things that are toxic to the viruses are usually going to end up being toxic to the host as well. So the first thing we're going to look at is groups of antibiotics and other drugs that are going to inhibit cell wall synthesis. By inhibiting cell wall synthesis, this will disrupt the protection from osmotic pressure. Most of these drugs are only going to be effective on growing cells because it stops peptidoglycan production. So dormant cells are going to be unaffected. First group is the beta-lactams. The functional por portion is a beta-lactam ring. And that's going to inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis by attaching to an enzyme that cross-links the NAM subunits. This is only effective on growing cells. This is going to include your penicillin, cephalosporins. They've made several alternatives to the natural penicillins that have beta-lactam semi-synthetic derivatives. With penicillin, your natural penicillins are penicillin G, which is injected, and penicillin V, which is oral. The synthetic penicillins are going to include oxacillin. It's a narrow spectrum drug that's only active on gram-positive organisms. It's resistant to the penicillinase or beta-lactamase that the organisms use to become resistant. So it's resistant to their resistant technique. Ampicillin has an extended spectrum and will include many of the gram-negative organisms. Your cephalosporins are going to inhibit cell walls similar to the penicillins, but they have a different beta-lactam ring. We do have some drugs that are penicillins that are also going to have a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Augmentin is an example that combines broader spectrum antibiotic amoxicillin with potassium clavulanate that is a non-competitive inhibitor of penicillinase. And it's not actually an antibiotic on its own. So the carbapenems, these are beta-lactams that are very broad spectrum. Probaxin is a combination of amipenem and celastatin. The celastatin is going to prevent degradation of the combination in the kidneys. Doropenem is useful against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Monobactams, these will include as trinoma. It's usually going to have low toxicity and it affects certain gram negatives including Pseudomonas and E. coli. The cyclosirins, these are semi-synthetics that are going to interfere with the alanine-alanine bridges and linking the NAM. This is only effective in growing cells.
Vancomycin, this is obtained from the Streptomyces orientalis. This directly interferes with the alanine-alanine bridges linking the NAM to inhibit cell wall synthesis. It is narrow spectrum. It's only effective on growing cells. This was the drug that was used for MRSA for a while, but now we're actually seeing Versa or the vancocillin resistant Staph aureus. So basotracin, this is going to block the secretion of NAG and NAM from the cytoplasm. It's a polypeptide antibiotic. Isoniazid and ethambutol, these disrupt the formation of the arabinogalactan mycolic acid present in the cell walls of the mycobacterium. These cells only reproduce every 12 to 24 hours, so it takes months to years of treatment to be effective. So the important thing to know in here is that these are the group that are going to inhibit cell wall synthesis. I don't generally ask for specific mechanisms for each drug, but that you know the categories and the main way that they're going to target organisms. So we do have some drugs that are going to inhibit fungal cell wall synthesis. Fungal cell walls are composed of various polysaccharides that contain the sugar 1,3-D-glucan. The echinocandins are a class of antifungal drugs that are going to inhibit the enzyme that synthesizes glucan. Capsofungin is one example of these. So another main way of targeting things is to inhibit protein synthesis. Proteins are used for structures, regulation, metabolism, enzymes, so they're a vital part of life. And the prokaryotic ribosomes differ from the eukaryotic ribosomes, so they're often a target of the antibiotics. The aminoglycosides are going to target the 30S ribosome. This would include streptomycin, amicacin, tobramycin, gentamicin, canamycin. These are going to change the shape of the 30S ribosome so it doesn't read the codons correctly. So the tetracyclines, these are going to also target the 30S ribosome and block the tRNA docking site, which is the A site in the ribosome. It includes tetracycline, doxycycline, tremocycline, oxytetracycline, chlortetracycline. The glycyclines, these were discovered in 2000. They're similar to the tetracyclines. They're broad spectrum. They're bacteriostatic. They'll attack the 30S ribosome. They will also inhibit rapid efflux, which is a mechanism of resistance. Tigacycline is one of them. So chloramphenicol is going to block the enzymatic site of the 50S subunit. This will prevent translation. The macrolides, these are things like clindamycin and erythromycin. They also bind the 50S subunit and prevent the ribosome from moving from one codon to the next. These also include clanthromycin, azithromycin, and the lincosamides. The streptogramins, these attack the 50S ribosome. Synersid is one that's a combination of two macrolides, quinupristin and dafospristin. The ketolides, these are semi-synthetic macrolides. They include telithromycin. There are restrictions in using these related to their toxicity, though. So mupirocin, this is going to selectively bind bacterial tRNAs for isoleucine, but not the eukaryotic tRNAs. This will prevent the incorporation of isoleucine, and it cripples the polypeptide production. Oxazolinidones, these are going to stop protein synthesis by blocking the initiation of translation. They're used as a last resort in treating gram-positive infections that are resistant to vancomycin and methicillin. So anything that is put in this category of being a last resort medication, they really do try and be conservative in using it and only use it in the cases where you've got a resistant infection. We do have organisms that are resistant to everything we have at this point. The pleuromutilins, this is a new class in 2000. Retopumilin is a semi-synthetic that was approved for topical use. It's only effective on gram positives. Another way that we can interfere with this is antisense nucleic acids. These are RNAs or single-stranded DNA molecules that are designed to be complementary to the specific mRNAs of the pathogen. Fomavirsin is the first of this class to be approved, and it's going to inactivate the 
CMV or cytomegalovirus in eye infections. So another mechanism is to disrupt the cytoplasmic membranes. These drugs get incorporated into the membrane in a lot of cases and then will damage the integrity. The polyenes, these include amphotericin B, it's fungicidal, it attaches to ergosterol, which is a lipid in the fungal membrane. Cholesterol makes human membranes somewhat susceptible, but most bacteria lack sterols and are going to be resistant. Gramocytin forms a channel through the membrane which will disrupt the integrity. The azoles, these are going to inhibit ergosterol synthesis. They're antifungal. Most bacteria are resistant because they lack the sterols. These will include fluconazole, myconazole, clotrimazole, which are now over the counter. Ketoconazole is less toxic than the amphotericin B for the systemic infections. And now we have the less toxic triazoles like voriconazole. The allylamines, these are going to also inhibit ergosterol synthesis. These include terbinafine and naphtaphene. Polymyxin, this is produced by the Bacillus polymyxa. It's going to target gram-negative bacteria. It will target Pseudomonas, but it is nephrotoxic, so it's usually used to topically. The Parazinamide is going to disrupt transport across the cytoplasmic membrane of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's most active against intracellular organisms and non-replicating bacteria. So tuberculosis replicates very slow, which would make it a good target. The lipipeptides are effective only on gram positives. Daptomycin or cubicin is produced by streptomyces and it's been approved for certain skin affections. It appears to attach to the membrane of the bacterial cell. We do have a couple of antiparasitic drugs that are going to target cytoplasmic membranes. Proziquanil and ivermectin. These will change the permeability of the cell membrane of many types of worms. So another mechanism is inhibiting metabolic processes. We try to target metabolic processes that are different from the host and use anti-metabolic agents. So types of anti-metabolic agents include heavy metals. They will inactivate enzymes, substances to block viral activation, adovacuone. This interferes with the electron transport chain in the protozoa and fungi agents that will disrupt tubulin polymerization and glucose uptake by the protozoa and parasitic worms, and then a metabolic agonist like sulfonilamide. The sulfonamides are going to be structural analogs or chemically similar to PABA or paraaminobutyric acid, so they're going to be very similar in shape. So many organisms will convert PABA into tetrahydrofolate, which is used as a coenzyme in purine and pyrimidine synthesis. By blocking the tetrahydrofolate synthesis, trimethoprim blocks THF synthesis. Humans get their THF from food, not PABA, so it blocks the second step in the pathway. Amantadine and romantadine, these are going to neutralize the acid of the phagolysosome and prevent viral uncoating. They're antiviral agents. So in 2008, the CDC showed that amantadine is no longer effective against the type A influenza viruses, so it's no longer prescribed for that. The protease inhibitors are going to interfere with the action of protease that HIV needs near the end of its replication cycle. These get used along with reverse transcriptase inhibitors in a cocktail of drugs. The reverse transcriptase inhibitors are going to act against the enzyme reverse transcriptase. They're harmless to humans because they don't have that enzyme. So then we have the agents that are going to inhibit nucleic acid. They block the replication of DNA or transcription. These will usually affect both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but they're generally not used for infection because of the toxicity, but they are used in cancer. So these are going to include your nucleotide or nucleoside analogs. They're going to be compounds that are going to look structurally similar to a nucleotide. They get incorporated in and change the shape and prevent further replication. So these can be useful with viruses because the viral DNA polymerase is much more likely to incorporate a non-functional base than the host. 
So this would include anti-HIV drugs like AZT. So some of these other drugs, these are not used for cancer, but they do interfere with nucleic acid synthesis in hair. The quinolones are fluoroquinolones. These will inhibit DNA gyrase to prevent the uncoiling and coiling of the bacterial DNA. Ciprofloxacin, this typically has little effect on eukaryotes or viruses, but it acts on replicating bacteria. It may interfere with replica replicating mitochondrial DNA. Rifampin or the rifamycins, these bind more readily to the prokaryotic RNA polymerase than in eukaryotes. These are used for mycobacterium tuberculosis and other slowly metabolizing pathogens. So clofazamine, this binds the DNA of the mycobacterium leprae and prevents normal replication and transcription. Pentamidine and pro propamine is isothionate, these are going to bind the protozoan DNA and they will prevent reproduction and metabolism. Actinomycin binds DNA and blocks DNA synthesis and RNA in both bacterial and eukaryotic cells. Because it's going to attack both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, it's generally not used for infection. So we do have some agents that will prevent viral attachment. They are blocked by the peptide and sugar analogs of the attachment or receptor proteins or attachment antagonists. So this includes artidone. Some cold and polio viruses are going to be susceptible there. There are many of these that are still being researched and developed. Planconeril is a synthetic agonist of the receptors of the coronavirus, like some colds, polio virus, and the Coxsackie virus. This blocks viral attachment and deters infection. Other antivirals, they will prevent viral fusion and entry. Maraviroc targets the receptors HIV uses to bind the cell. And fuvertide is a fusion inhibitor for HIV. So we have some drugs that will prevent viral uncoding or genome integration and nucleic acid synthesis. Amantadine and romantadine prevent viral uncoding. Raltegravir and Elvitagravir are competitive inhibitors on the integris enzyme in HIV. Acyclovir gets used for herpes infection. It's a nucleoside analog that is selectively used by the viral enzyme thymidine kinase. Famcyclovir and gancyclovir, these are derivatives with a similar mode of action. Rubavirin, this resembles guanine and accelerates mutation in RNA viruses. Cetofovir is used for CMV infections in the eyes. Arlodone is a synthetic antiviral that prevents the polio virus from uncoding. So drugs that inhibit viral exit. Xanamavir or Relenza and Oseltamavir or Tamiflu prevent viral exit. The interferons, these are produced by virally infected cells to help inhibit the spread. Alpha interferon has been used for viral hepatitis. Imiquimod is going to stimulate interferon production, and it's often used for genital warts. So we do have some other antifungal drugs. Griseofulvin, it's an antibiotic produced by penicillin, but it's active against the superficial dermatophyte fungal infections of the hair, nails or it's orally administrated and it blocks the microtubule assembly. Tilnaftate is a topical use for athlete's foot. It's an alternative to myconazole. Undicylenic acid is also a fatty acid with the antifungal activity, but not as effective as tilnaftate tilnaftate or the imidazoles. Pentamidine, this appears to bind DNA. It's used for pneumocystis pneumonia and several protozoan tropical diseases. So antiprotozoan drugs, many of these are still considered 
experimental, but the CDC may provide them on request when they're not commercially available. A lot of the infections that go with some of these protozoas from tropical areas just are not necessarily seen a whole lot in the U.S. So quinine is an anti-malarial. It's also a synthetic deliver. It also has synthetic derivatives like chloroquinine. There's the new mefloquine or larium that's for cases resistant to chloroquine, but it has psychotic side effects. The artemisinin and artemisinin-based combination therapies have anti-malarial properties. These come from Chinese medicine. They're being used a little bit more due to the increasing chloroquine resistance. There are problems with counterfeits of these drugs, so the drug may not have enough in there or actually be what the person is hoping for. Quinacrine is used for giardiasis. Diiodohydroxyquin or iodoquinol is used for intestinal amoebic infections. Metron Metronidazole or flagyl, this is an antiparasitic that acts on obligate anaerobes. It's used for things like trichomonas vaginalis that causes vaginitis, giardiasis, amoebic dysentery, and other anaerobes like clostridia. Tinidazole is similar and it's used for giardiasis, amoebiasis, and trichomoniasis. Nidazoxanide is an anaprotozoan. This is used for cryptosporidium diarrhea, giardiasis, amoebiasis, and several anaerobic and helminthic infections. So anti-helminthic drugs, these are going to target worms. Niclosamide is used for tapeworm infections. It inhibits ATP in the infection and it's under aerobic conditions. Prosequanol, this is used for tapeworm, several of the flukes, schistosomiasis. It alters the permeability of the plasma membrane and then the helminths undergo muscle spasms and become more susceptible to attack by the host's immune system. Mobendazole and albendazole are broad spectrum anti-helminthics. These are also used in livestock. Ivermectin, this is effective against many nematodes, several mites like scabies, ticks, insects like head lice. It's used primarily in livestock. So clinical considerations of the drugs, the availability, they need to be available. Most are readily available in the developed world, but in third world countries that, that may not be the case. The cost, so new drugs are very expensive to develop, so these can become more expensive. Stability, how long is its shelf life? The mode of transmission, oral is always easier, but may not necessarily give a great enough concentration. It may have toxicity with it. So the drug needs to be relatively non-toxic and non-allergenic and have selective toxicity. When we look at the spectrum of action, we have narrow and broad spectrum drugs. Narrow spectrum drugs are going to work only on a few pathogens. Broad spectrum drugs are effective against many kinds of pathogens. Generally, you want to use the most narrow spectrum you can get away with. When you have super infection, it's the development of infections by microbes that are not affected by the antimicrobial agents. When we have reduced normal flora, this is a problem as well. It's going to end up with reduced competition between the normal flora and the pathogens. Things like Candida albicans is unaffected by erythromycin. So it's free to cause infection when the an microbial antagonism is reduced by taking an antibiotic. The efficacy is looking at how effective they are. One test for this is the Kirby-Bauer test or disk diffusion. It tests for the susceptibility. You use small disks of paper that are going to be containing standard concentrations of the drugs. They get placed on an inoculated plate and incubated. So after they're incubated, you look for a zone of inhibition where the organisms were not able to grow next to the drug. So you generally are going to refer to a table because some drugs will be more soluble in the media than others. So a table is going to be a more reliable way of assessing sensitivity. When we talk about the MIC, it's the minimum inhibitory concentration. It's the smallest amount of the drug that will inhibit growth of the pathogen. This can be determined using broth dilution tests. The minimal bacterial cytoconcentration is the minimum amount required to kill a microbe. 
So remember, if you're just inhibiting growth, when that inhibiting agent is removed, a lot of times those organisms will start growing again. In some cases, that's OK. You want to inhibit growth and allow the immune system to get a handle on the infection. But other times, you actually need to be able to kill them. So routes of administration, topical or local is when it's applied directly. This works for external infections. Oral works for internal infections. It's simplest. But the downside is the drug concentrations are going to be lower. And there can be less compliance because the patient has to remember to take the drug. With intramuscular, it's going to be injected into the muscle via a needle. It allows diffusion through the blood in the muscle, but the concentration of the drug is a little bit less than it would be with an IV. With IV, you're going to have a greater concentration of the drug, but that may diminish rapidly as the liver and kidney remove it. So with IM and IV, those are going to require the patient actually be present with a healthcare provider for all of their doses, where with oral, they can take them on their own. So safety, one of the things we look at is toxicity. A lot of these drugs may be toxic to the kidney, liver, nerves, or may not be safe during pregnancy. Polymyxin and the aminoglycosides are nephrotoxin. Metronidazole or flagyl can result in a black, hairy tongue from the hemoglobin breakdown accumulating in the pap papillae of the tongue. So it's not necessarily dangerous, but it can be quite disturbing to look and see your tongue appear to have black hair on it. Tetracycline, it can form complexes with the calcium in the teeth. So occasionally you'll see this where a child's been on antibiotics. It's usually when you see it is from children and their teeth will be permanently stained. So the therapeutic index is the ratio comparing a dose a patient can tolerate to the drug's effective dose. Its therapeutic range or therapeutic window is going to be the range of concentrations that the drug is effective without being toxic. So it may be a great drug that's really effective. However, if it's toxic, that's going to be a problem. Allergies, particularly anaphylactic shock. 0.1% of Americans are allergic to penicillin. Others may have milder reactions. So that's actually a pretty significant number of people to have an allergy. Big one is the drugs can disrupt the normal flora. Then you end up with secondary infections from lack of competition. Candida albicans or yeast infections are a very common example. Another one, when patients are on a lot of antibiotics, they can end up with Clostridium difficile in the colon or C. diff that will cause pseudomembranous colitis. In some of these, they've looked at helping to try and reestablish the normal microbiota to help keep the pathogens in check. So fecal transplants are one example of looking at how they're trying to reestablish the normal bacteria in the colon for people that have had the C. diff infections. So with antibiotic resistance, not all pathogens are going to be equally sensitive to an antimicrobial. So we have R plasmids or R factors. These are going to acquire the genes for resistance. They occur in viruses as well. So the susceptible strain of the organism dies, and then the competition decreases for the resistant strains. So these genes or factors can be acquired through transformation, transduction, or conjugation. The antimicrobial agent does not produce the resistance, but what it does is it selects for the resistant microbes that already have the resistance and allows them to proliferate. So ways that organisms have become resistant, they can produce enzymes that will destroy, deactivate the drugs. So the beta lactamases have done this. There's over 200 lactamases that have been identified that break down the beta lactam ring so that that whole class of drugs will not work. They can slow or prevent entry of the drug into the cell, so the porin protein to the penicillins and tetracyclines. They can alter the target or the receptor for the drugs, so the sulfonylamides, erythromycin, have this problem. Cells may alter their metabolic chemistry. They may pump out the drug before it can act. The efflux pumps are often able to pump out multiple drugs, and that will create multiple drug resistance. When you have multiple resistance, this means that you have acquired resistance to multiple drugs. 
This is particularly common to see in the medical environment where many drugs are used. It's very common with staph infections, strep, enterococcus, plasmodium, and pseudomonas to see these be multiple drug resistant pathogens. Some of them will have cross resistance where you develop resistance to one drug and it may confer resistance to other similar drugs like the aminoglycosides. So we can have synergism and antagonism come into play. With synergism, your chemotherapeutic effect of the two drugs is greater together than either given alone. So using penicillin and streptomycin together. Antagonism, here is where your simultaneous use of drugs will make them less effective than used alone. So penicillin and tetracycline don't work well together. So ways to slow antibiotic resistance. When a person is taking an antibiotic, it's important they take a high enough concentration to kill the sensitive cells and inhibit others for the body's defenses to defeat them. Sometimes using antimicrobials in combination, you specifically want to look for ones that can have a synergistic effect and avoid the ones that have an antagonistic effect. Limit the use to necessary cases. This has been particularly challenging when a lot of times a patient doesn't understand and they want an antibiotic for something that it's not appropriate for. A little more challenging is to create new variations of existing drugs or look for new antimicrobials. A little more challenging is to try and find new ways to inhibit the microbes. So we need to understand their chemistry better and find ways that we can interfere with it. Biofilms will resist antimicrobials more effectively than free living cells. They will also retard diffusion and slow metabolic rates, making the drugs less effective. So drugs like mycobacterium tuberculosis have become resistant by synthesizing an unusual protein, the MFPA. It serves as a decoy to protect the target of the drug. So it makes this other substance, this MFPA, and the drug will target the MFPA and not what it's normally supposed to. Antibiotic misuse. This is one of the biggest reasons for the resistance. It's a problem because antibiotics are so easily available in less developed parts of the world. They're rarely prescribed by a physician and they're readily available for the public to acquire and be used inappropriately. This can even happen pretty easily in the United States. It's very easy just to drive across the border and acquire these drugs in Mexico often. In the developed world, they still get prescribed for inappropriate conditions. In about 70% of animal feed, it's going to contain antibiotics. We use them to promote growth. And a big problem is it is expensive to replace the drugs with new ones. So that is the end of this lecture.